Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Ayana Brown and I am a conservation engineer with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We are part of the United States Department of Agriculture and we are the lead federal sponsor on this project. Thank you for attending tonight virtually. Um, the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Flood Protection Project is in the beginning, it's in the planning stages, and this is our first uh, public informational meeting. There will be another one held at this same time later this week on Thursday, so if you're unable to participate in this entire meeting, or if you know someone, once you listen, think that they should also hear about this project, please um, forward them the information and have them register on Eventbrite. Okay, so... We're gonna get started now. Uh, we intentionally waited a couple of minutes after the original time. We had a few more folks register for this event, but uh, they may have be having some technical difficulties or a schedule conflict. Anyway, we will catch them up. There is a portion at the end of our presentation absolutely for discussion and questions and answers. So um, think of anything that we don't answer in our presentation or anything you want further clarification on and you will be able to ask it at that time at the end. Okay, so here we go. Next slide, please. All right, and we did want to give you just orient a little orientation to our Zoom platform and the way that we're using it. So for questions and answers, we would prefer that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You do have the chat option, but the Q&A will be a little bit more uh, effective for our technical person to be able to get to your question as soon as possible. Um, also, we want you to know that we recognize that you are muted and that is just going to be until the end of the presentation. Once we finish the presentation, you will be able to ask live questions if you prefer, or you can continue to type them in the question and answer section. Um, either way, we will answer them. I believe some of you have already taken uh, advantage. We do have Spanish language interpretation available. And so that is available oral and written and that will be for the length of the presentation as well as during the question and answer portion at the end or for open discussion. So um, please take advantage of those services. You'll see the little red circle um, interpretation icon at the bottom of the bar and that is what you press and then you can select which channel you'd like to listen to. And you can toggle back and forth, um, whatever you're comfortable in a little bit of Spanish, that will be available for you. Okay, great, thank you. So this is our agenda for tonight. We want to just give you an introduction to the project. As I mentioned, we are in the beginning stages. Um, we are in what NRCS refers to as the planning stage. This is where we develop our watershed plan hyphen environmental document. And uh, one of my co-presenters is gonna explain a little bit more about what that entails, that document entails uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But this is our agenda. Broadly speaking for tonight, we're gonna give you some introductions to who we are and what we're going to do in this process. We're gonna talk about our planning team and in the roles of the individual participants or team members. We're going to talk about a little bit the project background and give you an idea of some things that have already been done in the watershed because I know that you are aware that a lot of things have been done in this watershed and it's an ongoing process to continue to uh, improve the situation and make it as safe and healthy and enjoyable as possible for everyone who lives there. And we're also going to give you an outline of our planning process. We're going to talk about some flood mitigation strategies and just give you examples of different practices and different measures that we have used in flood protection projects in the past that may be applicable to this area, this landscape, it, it might fit in well. And we hope to get your opinions on that. We want to know not only if you're having flooding concerns, but we also want to know what you want the flood protection to look like once it's in place, how you need it to blend with your landscape so that it's enjoyable and it adds value uh, in addition to just safety and protection for your life. Okay, and we'll talk about where we go after this. As I mentioned, this will not be the last public informational meeting. This is the first one and there will be a, a couple more. So there will be more opportunity to give input and find out where the project is headed and the alternatives as they're developed. So um, we'd love to hear from you. As I mentioned, 
at the end. We will have time for open discussion, questions and answers, or just comments. If you want to verify that we look at something, um, some features that you're aware of, or a particular area that floods, feel free to mention that at that time. And once again, you will be unmuted then, so you can speak, or you may continue to type in the question and answer section. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I am Ayana Brown, as the slide says, and along here with me is David Everett, the principal city planner for the city of Providence, Michael Phillips, the town planner with the town of Smithfield, as well as consultant engineering firm project manager, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker with DDK Engineering, Chris Sargent, who's the senior environmental planner also with DDK Engineering, and he's the one providing us technical assistance with the question and answer section of the webinar. And also Mr. Andrew Hoke, who is a senior water resources engineer with DDK. And I wanna mention right up front that the reason why the city of Providence and the town of Smithfield are represented here is because they are the sponsors of the project. They are the ones that officially requested it assistance from the federal government and my agency, NRCS. Okay, please, next slide. All right, so who are we? We are an agency within the Department of Agriculture, as I mentioned, and this program specifically is titled the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program. And we are available to provide assistance to the public via this program for anyone who requests our assistance. It's a voluntary program and our sponsors are typically need to be an entity of government because they need to have certain authorities and abilities that they will be able to enact and operate and maintain the structures that are developed and implemented under this program safely. So this is not the federal government coming in saying you have a problem, you need to clean it up. This is instead your sponsors, the city of Providence and the town of Smithfield saying, hey, we see that we have a problem here and we heard about your program and we think that you might be able to help us. Let's look at that. And so that's what we're doing right now. Okay, next slide. All right, so when you hear the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources Conservation Service, you might not automatically think of us in a more urbanized setting like the city of Providence or the town of Smithfield, but we definitely do work in urban settings. We work everywhere in every state, all across the country and most US territories. We have offices um, that provide assistance. And in particular in Rhode Island, we have our combination offices of field and state offices in Warwick. And so there is quite a bit of agriculture actually in Rhode Island. I think some people discovered that more and more uh, during the pandemic, a, a horrible event, but this was a silver lining in that people were able to know more about where their food came from and maybe frequent the farmer's markets a little bit more. It's more comfortable to know that it's grown locally and available to you. So you don't have to worry so much about where it's been in between. But as most of you probably know, mushrooms are big in Rhode Island and you do have um, a couple of mushroom farms and you have a lot that grow wild in the non-industrialized forested areas as well. You also in the city of Providence in particular, you have a big aquaculture um, operation that is also in the category of farming just in water, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And you also have fish hatcheries, uh, whether they are held by the state government or by local producers, um, they are prevalent as well. And you have some very nice dairy and beef cattle operations, hog operations and farms that when you get back in into the property off the road, they do look quite picturesque and um, some nice, nice operations going on there in the state. So next slide, please. All right, and so in this slide, you can see a picture that's actually Gotham Greens all lit up at night. It looks quite lovely, a um, little bit busier and more hectic during the day, but still uh, a wonderful operation. And also these are examples from Deep Roots Farms of some cattle that you have um, right there in Rhode Island, so in Gloucester. So definitely there is agriculture in Rhode Island. And that is an important component for this program because we need to have a 20% ag or rural communities benefit with this program. And so specifically for this project. And these are some of the operations that are helping you to achieve that in this watershed. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so one of the ways we help with flood protection in particular is that we have a large history of building dams. Um, we have been doing this for several decades and, and some of our dams look similar to the pictures that are shown there. There are majority earthen dams, but they may be covered in rock or they may um, have parts of them that are concrete instead, like the outlet where all the water is transitioning back to the natural stream. But uh, we have been doing this, as, as I mentioned, for several decades, but this is not the only type of practice that we can install for flood protection. It depends on the landscape. It depends on um, what will fit best in the environment and what will be the most economically feasible and environmentally defensible for the project at the time that it's constructed. Okay, next slide, please. And this is other examples of different flood protection measures that we have installed. Um, flood prevention channels, a picture on the left, if you'll notice there's a large channel, then there's a little bit of a buffer area, and then there's a road. That's a requirement with NRCS projects is that there is space to maintain the work that is installed. So not only are we installing flood protection measures, but we're also making sure that they can be operated and maintained safely safely for the sponsors, but then also safely for the interaction with the public. And that's something that's uh, very important to us because we know that if you install it, it's not a one in one, it's something that will absolutely need maintenance and it will need to be operated. And we want to make sure that we explain that to everyone who might see it or know about it and understand what's going on so that your interaction with it is also safe um, for yourselves primarily, but then also so that the measures can continue to function. Uh, if you understand what they're doing, I think you'll appreciate seeing them on the landscape a little bit more. And so on the right side, the picture on the right side is the irrigation channel. And with this project, um, we're not just looking at public lands to consider for installing measures, we're also looking at private lands. So wherever the flooding is occurring and wherever we can best use the landscape to reduce the impact of the flooding, if not stop it altogether, um, that is what we're looking at doing. But as an agency focused on agriculture in rural communities, definitely we take into consideration uh, water supply for any of our producers and the farmers in the area and what they need. And so the project uh, will not remove all water. It will remove the hazardous portion of the water, but some water will always be needed, obviously, in the rivers and streams and irrigation canals um, to let us prosper as a community. Okay, next slide, please. So a little bit more about the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program. Just want you to know that we are operating this program under the law, so that makes some restrictions to it, but also there are a lot of flexibilities in program policy. As I stated earlier, we've been doing this for several decades, and you can see at the third bullet, um, we were first authorized to start working with communities and flooding through the Flood Control Act of 1944. Um, and a lot of times that's abbreviated as public law 534. Um, and then the major public law that a lot of people are aware of is public law 83-566, which is often referred to as PL 566 in reference to this program. And that is another one that has given us even further authorities to look at watershed activities and communities and um, try to help out with flood prevention, but then also with a couple of other things. And then we had the pilot watershed um, program that was authorized through an Appropriations Act in 1954 as well. So we not only need the authority to have the program and have the um, policy and regulations surrounding the program, but we need funding. So definitely we are very um, appreciative and excited that Congress has seen fit to fund the program at higher levels in recent years and we're able to offer it to you today. We also um, were previously authorized under the Resource Conservation and Development Program in 1981. However, that authorization, that program has since been deauthorized. However, if there were any flood control structures that were constructed under that program, we do still provide assistance to sponsors in terms of any technical questions they have with regards to operation and maintenance. And all four of these authorities, any projects that were constructed under these four authorities are eligible for our watershed rehabilitation program. We have other programs in NRCS where we do construct 
dams and uh, channels and other measures that can be used to hold or remove water. But those practices authorized under different programs are not authorized for um, rehabilitation with us. So just pointing that out a little bit, mostly we work on individual properties, private landowners, individual farms. Um, so when we are talking about something that has community-wide impact, that's gonna be multiple landowners and it should be under one of these authorities. And that is what will enable us um, to help again in the future with that same project. Okay. And then on the right, you can see another, I'm sorry, one second, thank you. Um, you can see another uh, graphic of the watershed and you can see where the town of Smithfield is a large portion of the Wenasquatucket River watershed actually. And then uh, Providence is down there kind of towards the end or towards the outlet. And definitely um, with NRCS programs and I think good sound engineering that the state of Rhode Island would allow in general anyway, uh, we want to make sure that we're not only pushing <laughs> the floodwaters off people locally, but that we know where it's ending up and we're carrying it safely to a, uh, a safe outlet that will not create problems for other people downstream. Okay. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the role of NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Services, my agency, and we are the project administrators for the project. Um, we are the ones that will be overseeing it through every phase. As I mentioned, we're in phase one, where we develop the watershed plan hyphen environmental document, which is typically an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. And the following phase is design, and then there's construction. And that's going to be discussed a little bit more later. But this phase that we're in now in planning, this takes quite a bit of time. Um, this, this process here will be in it for several months. So once again, you'll have uh, multiple opportunities to comment on the project and see how it develops and what direction we're headed in. But also my agency uh, conducts reviews of the project locally, Rhode Island and RCS staff will, but also nationally, we have a lot of national specialists who are gonna be looking at this project as well. And we do provide the majority of the project funding um, for the project <clears throat> because we're dealing specifically with flood protection. There are other authorities, other things that we can look at under this program, the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program, um, but the cost share rates will differ. So I just wanna throw that out there in case you have heard about other projects and other places and know that those uh, sponsors, those municipalities kicked in a little bit more funding. Uh, there are differences depending upon how the program is used. So this one is focused on flood protection and that allows us excuse me, to provide a little bit more funding. We also coordinate with the government agencies and the public throughout the process. Excuse me one second. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So we also have the role of local sponsors in the project, very essential. NRCS would not be here and could not do this project without them. And as I mentioned, they are the town of Smithfield and the city of Providence. So the town and the city are responsible for interacting with the public, but also uh, acquiring the permits at their own cost. And they are responsible for acquired land rights acquisition, which could be acquiring the land outright through purchase, or it could be acquiring easements, uh, long-term easements for the life of the project um, to be able to operate and maintain them safely. And the easement as was shown in the picture earlier, like with the flood prevention channel is going to, or the property acquisition, either way that the land rights are acquired will encompass not only the flood prevention measure, but the way to get to it and out back from it and also allow machinery to turn around. So that maintenance kind of area is something else that will be looked at as well. And they'll be securing that in their process. And they do all of these things in, in addition to the long-term operation and maintenance at their own cost. So the federal funding is here for the implementation of the project, but we do not operate and maintain it long-term and that paying for that is a local concern. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so NRCS has hired a consult consultant engineering firm, DDK Engineering, 
and they are assisting us greatly with this project. They are conducting field reconnaissance and gathering background data. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> they are completing the engineering analysis to ca ca characterize the watershed. And they're also doing a lot of the economic analysis and social analysis and combining it all to develop um, alternatives for the project. And in that process, they are evaluating different flood prevention strategies along with everybody else on the team um, to make sure that the final environmental document that is prepared and is sent out to you and everyone else in the public for review um, is something that we can actually construct, that it's actually feasible to put it on the landscape, not only economically and socially and environmentally responsibly, but also just physically, um, that that's something that's possible. So. And that's a lot of their role in this project. Next slide, please. And then there is you who are very critical on this project. We definitely wanna hear from you, um, whether it's in this meeting or sending us an email. We do have a project email address set up and you'll see that um, towards the end of this presentation. Or if you want to contact Mike with the town of Smithfield or Dave with the City of Providence and let them know your questions or your concerns, that's appropriate. But we wanna make sure that the people who are actually in this watershed give us feedback and let us know whether or not this project sounds like something you want and is going to satisfy what you are expecting um, once we explain the parameters of what we are allowed to do and also um, what is feasible on the landscape, what, what's possible. One of the things with our NRCS watershed and flood prevention operations project is we do need to have a positive cost benefit ratio. So we're not trying to put in anything and we won't put in anything that's going to uh, bring the area down. We have to put in things that work and that will blend in with the landscape as best as they possibly can and, and be a benefit to you now and long-term. Uh, the requirement when we talked about operation and maintenance and that the sponsors are responsible for long-term operation and maintenance, that's going to be somewhere between 50 and 100 years. So it is a, a long-term commitment. And to that end, we do a lot to try to engage with you um, throughout this process to make sure that what we're going to end up with is something that you want to see. And so everyone who lives and work or works in the watershed are the people that we're talking about and um, businesses, hospitals, schools, definitely we want to hear from them as well. With our watershed and flood prevention operations program in various states, um, we have implemented flood protection measures actually on school property. And we have to make sure that we know the age of the kids, that we're doing it in a safe manner, that there's a way to separate them from the flood protection measure if that's necessary. And if it's not, uh, just make everyone aware of it, including the school administrators. Uh, even if it's property that's owned by the municipality, like the town or the city, uh, the educators need to be aware of it so that they understand what's going on in the landscape and, and can make sure the students stay safe and also the students might be interested in it as well. So, okay, next slide. And we have some excellent project partners on this project, the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council. Um, they were the ones that talked to NRCS initially about the program, and then they talked to the town of Smithfield and the city of Providence about the program um, based on their conversations with NRCS. And so they have been vested and interested in this project from the very beginning, and they are assisting with outreach and providing background information as they have been working in the Wenasquatucket River watershed <laughs> uh, for quite some time now and are very familiar with the issues that are going on in the area. Okay, thank you. Next slide. All right, so in this section, we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts a little bit more about this specific project, <clears throat> more so about the Wenasquatucket River watershed in the specific areas where we're working. Um, as you saw from the earlier graphics, and there'll be some more maps, the watershed is larger than the area that we're working in. With NRCS's program, we can only work in areas where we have sponsorship. And so the city of Providence and the town of Smithfield have stepped up to be sponsors. So those are the areas that we're gonna focus on for actually install installing the um, flood protection measures. But we're also gonna talk about, outline the planning process and we're gonna talk about, we're gonna show you some examples of types of flood protection measures that we have used in the past that we think might be 
applicable in this situation, but no decisions have been made yet. That's part of the process in doing the watershed plan hyphen environmental document is that we analyze and we consider pretty much everything. The dams that I showed you before, the flood prevention canals that I showed you before, um, in addition to these other flood protection measures and see what is suitable and feasible and what will be effective um, in this particular setting. So we haven't really thrown anything off the table, um, but <clears throat> we do have to make sure that we're going to make an economically and environmentally defensible project. So, okay, next slide, please. All right, and so why are we here uh, in this watershed? We have experienced some flooding, um, a lot of significant flooding as the, the intense storm cycles have seemed to stepped up in the last decade or so. Um, we're, we're experiencing more and more flooding in places that didn't used to see that drastic of flooding that it was really interfering with many people's lives. But now that's happening more and more and the city of, of Providence and town of Smithfield have experienced that. So that they talked to NRCS about it and um, that is how we got to where we are right now. Next slide. Okay. So with this project, as I mentioned, we are aware that you have had different studies done before, but specifically um, this project is looking at actually getting to the point of installation, actually putting in some flood protection measures that change the level of flooding that you're experiencing um, to make it better. So this is not just a study for the purpose of studying. We will be using those studies though as background information and providing us with a knowledge base about what has already been done and what some of the thoughts were um, in the past about what needed to be done and whether or not those are still viable or if something in the, in the environment has changed. Um, we'll definitely look at that. But <clears throat> we want to address the goal in the end when we get to the end of phase three is that we will have actually uh, install flood protection measures that will address the destructive flooding that has been happening in these portions of the watershed. So um, that's that's where we we're, we're headed for. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. All right, and as we mentioned, um, approximately over the last decade, at least since 2010, more and more intense storms have been coming to the area. And it's, it's increasing the, the water levels that you're seeing in the streams in the river. And um, it's increasing the overflow from those rivers and streams onto the street, into roads, uh, into some people's homes and that kind of thing. And so um, this is very disruptive. It's a little bit unhealthy for the community and uh, it can make some dangerous situations for a period of time. So we're gonna try to install things that will correct that. Okay, next slide. But we want to um, understand the environment and respect some flood prevention measures or protection measures that have already been installed. And you do have a hurricane barrier that was installed um, at Fox Point near Rising Sun Mills by the Army Corps of Engineers. And that was installed back in the 60s and it's still functioning today. That is a joint effort of operation and maintenance between the Army Corps of Engineers and the city of Providence. So um, we're going to we're aware of it and we're gonna take that into account. And the purpose of NRCS's program with the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program is not to take over something that another federal government agency has installed. We wanna to try to work with it. If we find out there are some areas that it's not working, we're gonna go back to that federal agency who owns it and first installed it um, to let them know and see how we can work together. But we are careful about not overlapping federal funds because that's illegal. So um, we're going to make sure that we respect these measures that whoever has installed them already and uh, consult with the original designer, installer, and the current owner um, of the, the project. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so uh, at this point, I believe I will turn it over to Mr. Jeff Tucker. He is the lead with the DDK Engineering and Associates, and um, he will be talking to you about the overview of the project and a couple of other things. So, Jeff, take it away. Thank you very much, Ayana, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and, 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 and um, uh, your, your very valuable time. 
as Ayana had indicated, we are in the public presentation, uh, uh, public informational meeting phase of this planning study. And I just wanted to reiterate, you know, we're here to not only give folk an overview of where the project is going, but very much, uh, you know, solicit and, and receive your input and your thoughts. And so um, please have your comments, send them in, your questions, and at the end of this presentation. So I'm just going to take a few slides here and, and get a little bit more detail into the project. And then I think on slide 32, Andy will be talking about some of the some of the specific measures that we're starting to take a look at. So the um, the, the Wanasquatucket River Shed companies encompasses approximately 52 square miles. We've seen the watershed map here a couple of times. And the one over to your right is a land use map. And you can tell in the, the green areas is, is less dense and rural, some of the blues and the reservoirs and such. And as we go from the, from the upper left down to the lower right, we're into the more urban areas until ultimately we get down into the city and to the mouth of the river. Um, it's of that 52 square miles, the city of Providence encompasses approximately 5.9 areas, uh, square miles of land that, that just flow into the river and Smithfield about 24.4. Some of the other communities as we saw in North Providence and North Springfield, Johnston and, and, and Gloucester. Some of the numbers, it's about 35.8% developed overall and uh, about half of the watershed's population is um, uh, located within the city itself. Next slide, please. As Ayana had mentioned, you know, there's been a lot of good work over time and our, um, our mission is to build upon that. And so we just wanted to, to, to show you, you know, um, you know, just some of these, I'm sure there's others as well of, of, of a lot of the work that has been done. We have this information, we're absolutely utilizing this information. And as I said, building upon it uh, and not redoing. Next slide, please. Okay, so a overview of the watershed planning process. You know, we're gonna talk in a moment, what is the approximate timeline and the purpose and need. Uh, we're gonna be defining what is the, you know, National Environmental Policy Act, the planning process outline activities. We're gonna to touch base on some of the human and environmental resources. And uh, as Ari been mentioned, some of the flood prevention, damage reduction, some of the potential solutions, the mitigative measures that Andy will be talking here in, in a couple of minutes about. Next slide. Okay, so an overall timeline of this watershed and flood prevention operations program, the planning process, this is the process that we're in right now. It's approximately 18 months in, in, in length. So we were brought on and this project started, you know, kind of officially the planning piece of this process, not the time leading up to it, uh, about six months ago, last fall. And it's about a year and a half, 18 months overall. So here we are about six months in, we're having our first public informational meeting. There'll be a second uh, a meeting here in a couple of days, as Ayana indicated. And uh, then we will be taking all that information and going through and really evaluating these different potential alternatives really specific for the communities that you folks are in. And we'll be evaluating them and looking at them and then bringing them back to the public in, um, you know, in, in, in six, another six months or so later, later this year. And, uh, and, and by the time that the planning process is completed, that will be about a year from now. And then at some point in the future will be the design process. You know, once the specific I, uh, uh, mitigative measures, the things that really ought to be in, in put in to help flood reduction, will be going through a design permitting phase. That's normally a year or so in construction after that. Next slide, please. Okay, we mentioned the purpose and need. The purpose and need is really a fundamental component of the a National Environmental Policy Act. Some of you may recognize it as NEPA. And so what is the purpose of this federal action? The federal action meaning NRCS is, is you know, applying resources, spending money on this project. And then the purpose of this federal action is to increase flood protection, flood prevention and watershed protection to reduce damages flood from flooding and in along the one of Squatucket River floodplain and at priority locations as really determined through this study. 
and, and as I indicated a minute ago, which includes historical evidence as well. So that's the purpose of the project. The need is because as Ayana indicated, there is repeated flooding. This flooding may be increasing a little bit as we go through you know, climate change. This repeated flooding is causing damages to residential, to commercial development and infrastructure. And it does present a, you know, a safety risk to the public. So part of our mission here is to really identify and um, implement these measures, um, which is absolutely needed. Next slide, please. All righty. So the planning process, and I just mentioned NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. It's really the three phases. Ayana touched base on that a little while ago. The uh, NEPA uh, became law in 1970. It's very, very successful. It's been really the to bring in the public into this important process at the beginning of, of, the, of the planning process. It establishes this framework for the nation for consistency of how you know, environmental protection is really to be implemented. And it is required for all major federal actions such as this study. So if you look at the right side of your screen, we're in phase one, which is the collection and analysis process. And then from there, we'll be entering in the phase two, making decisions. And again, the public is very much part of that decision making. Ultimately, the project will move into phase three is application and evaluation. We're going to be implementing the plan, designing and constructing, you know, different things. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more on the overview for the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. So what does NEPA do? It requires uh, the opportunity for the public participation, making sure that you know, we're reaching out and, and, and inviting the public and soliciting your input. It requires disclosure about the action. What is it that's going to be done ultimately? And to make sure that people are aware that people have an opportunity to weigh in, to comment on it. It requires absolute consideration of environmental impacts. We just no longer go out and do things without regard. We have to, this is very much a holistic um, process, planning process that we go through. It does consider the economic benefits, absolutely. And in, in considering environmental and economic and, and, and social and, and um, uh, cultural concerns and a number of other really important concerns results in informed and better decision making. Next slide, please. Okay, so watershed project plan. You know, ultimately the planning process that we're in right now will be accumulating and in, 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 in concluding with, you know, a detailed amount of information that is going to be, be, that will then be setting the stage for implementing these measures. We're starting out with, or will be starting out as this public participation process unfolds with this array of, of very site specific alternatives that may make sense. We're getting good information as we speak. We'll be going through that process of screening them and ultimately um, boiling down to what's referred to as the preferred alternative. What makes most sense? What is economics and environmental and addresses cultural and historical and, and, uh, you know, and other very important aspects of this? And ultimately it will uh, uh, get down there to, to the preferred alternatives. And those will be laid out in detail in this watershed project plan. This plan as it comes together, then and when it will be in a draft or a preliminary form will be issued back out to the public for public participation, public comment. And those comments come back, we're responsible to address them and then move on. Next slide. Alrighty. Uh, the planning process, again, is to gather background information, build upon the work that's been completed already. We are identifying interested parties. As I mentioned at the beginning here and bringing in the, the Watershed Council as an example, obviously the communities, the local sponsors, our project partners, holding these public meetings, determining specific objectives, you know, we are conducting inventory of resources in a watershed assessment. As I mentioned, part of that, a very important part is a social assessment and an assessment on the economics. We're going to be identifying and formulating alternatives. We're going to evaluate and then determine what that preferred alternative is. Next slide, please. 
So what are some of the resources considered through the NEPA process? Uh, certainly things like air quality, you know, visual character, aesthetics, and land use, all of these things, hazardous materials, hazardous waste that may be out there, biological resources, and certainly infrastructure and utilities. We can't just go in haphazardly and, and, and look to build something. All of these different resources are considered as we go through that screening process on the alternatives. Next slide. Okay, so some of the other resources considered by NEPA, water resources, obviously streams, the lakes, the rivers, those types of things, wetlands, they're all part of this um, resources. We go through the, this um, uh, review of the different alternatives. We look at the geology and the soils, you know, how is it affecting current conditions? How might, how might we, when we build something or, or, or look at an alternative, how, might, how would that affect? the soils and the geology, noise, those types of things. Obviously the cultural resources we mentioned, social economics, and very much so on in environmental justice. So it's a very encompassing evaluation. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Andy Hoke and Andy's gonna to start to touch base on some of the more specific measures that we're, that we're looking at. And thank you for your time this evening. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Hoke. I'm a water resource engineer with uh, DDK Engineering, and thank you for joining and participating in uh, this evening's meeting. I'll be touching on a few of the uh, different flood mitigation strategies that may be available and for use um, with this project. Uh, the primary objective with flood mitigation strategies is to try to reduce the amount of water storm flow that arrives at the receiving water, the Wounds Pawtucket, and to reduce or prevent any damages to existing structures. Uh, there are a number of different strategies that can be implemented. Um, some of the items that I'll be mentioning tonight uh, can be used in a standalone type of scenario or can be used together with other uh, flood mitigation strategies in concert. Um, the preferred mitigation strategy is usually selected based on the physical characteristics of the site and the watershed. And oftentimes not just one strategy fits all. So um, there's a long menu and uh, many other items that that may not be presented this evening. Uh, a few of the items that I'll be talking about include flood volume and rate, rate reduction strategies where we're considering uh, the creation of stormwater detention basins or modification of existing reservoirs. We'll be talking about floodplain access and the importance of maintaining, improving, or preserving uh, access to floodplains. We'll be touching on green, green infrastructure and the, the added benefit to water quality in the watershed from green infrastructure. We'll be talking about avoidance, uh, including removal of existing structures or modification of existing structures. Uh, floodproofing, whether that be wet or dry uh, floodproofing strategies. And then finally, some of uh, the other various uh, drainage improvements that can be made uh, within the watershed. So next slide. So the first uh, mitigation strategy we'd like to hit on is detention structures. In this scenario, we're looking to disconnect uh, upstream flows from the receiving water whether that be through the creation of a, uh, a large stormwater detention basin uh, or modification of uh, an existing reservoir and spillway. The whole intention with uh, vol flood volume and rate reduction mitigation strategies is to create uh, storage volume so that those storm flows can be uh, stored, detained, and released at a controlled rate so as to reduce or prevent flooding. 
Next slide. Next, uh, floodplain access and uh, the mitigation strategies that are associated. Uh, floodplains are an extremely valuable resource and uh, one that not only provides uh, flood reduction uh, within the watershed, and that's, that's primarily done through reduced velocities and storage that, that's provided within the floodplain. Uh, for those that are not familiar, we're talking about uh, large, relatively flat green spaces or wooded areas adjacent to the stream uh, that can store large volumes of, of storm flow. Maintaining or preserving these uh, floodplains is essential to uh, reducing flooding in, in the watershed. Next slide. So green infrastructure, you may have heard the term before, uh, um, and there are a few different uh, interpretations or definitions, but basically we're talking about strategies that include uh, use of uh, greenery and natural environments in order to help promote infiltration of storm flows. And uh, just a basic about uh, watershed hydrology, of course, uh, wooded and green spaces within the watershed are much less likely to result in flooding as, as that vegetation offers the benefit of uptake of water and uh, reduction of flow velocities. Well, the same strategy is, is really being uh, presented in this green infrastructure mitigation strategy. Um, additionally, uh, vegetation offers a, a great benefit of filtering uh, harmful toxins or nutrients uh, from stormwater flows and uh, the uptake uh, from that vegetation uh, prevents it from arriving in the receiving water. So these are very important strategies. Next slide shows us a few uh, various examples of green infrastructure. Um, a few examples on the right there include different sorts of uh, development patterns, whether that be through implementation of, of different zoning regulations that cluster development together and preserve larger green spaces. Uh, it could include establishment of vegetated swales or wetland buffers, again, some sort of uh, uh, greenery that that will help filter and slow stormwater flows before they arrive at the, at the receiving water. Um, and then other strategies that uh, are focused more on infiltration of, of storm flows. So rain gardens, uh, bioretention areas, and the like. Next slide. So, in this slide, we're looking at a few example or an example of an avoidance uh, mitigation strategy. Uh, there may be structures located within the floodplain uh, that if uh, it makes economic sense, um, could be considered for potential removal uh, and return the area back to a natural state, a green space. Um, in this instance, we're looking at uh, potential purchasing and buyout and removal of properties. Next slide. In some instances where we might be looking at uh, historical structures or uh, structures that are maybe just on the fringe of the floodplain, uh, we could talk about avoidance strategies that uh, raise those structures out of the floodplain. Uh, and here you see a, a few examples where uh, two different structures were elevated above the, the flood elevation. Next slide. There are several different ways of uh, improving existing structures uh, from flood damages through either wet or dry flood proofing methods. Uh, dry flood proofing methods include modification of the structure where you try to prevent stormwater flows from entering the, 
the uh, structure in the first place. So that can include uh, the placement of shields or um, uh, protection at doorways and windows so as to prevent water from entering. It can also include the installation of backflow uh, devices on sewers and drains within the structure to prevent that water from entering uh, in the basement space. And the next slide shows us uh, an example of wet flood proofing, where existing appliances and utilities that are located uh, within the basement or first floor space Anything that, that's located um, below the base flood elevation is then relocated and moved up to a higher elevation uh, base, above that base flood. Uh, additionally, structures can be modified with openings that um, promote uh, flood waters to enter the, the structure readily and then also exit. So you're, you're working with the environment instead of trying to keep uh, the water out of the house. Next slide. There are several different drainage improvement uh, mitigation strategies that can be implemented. And you're gonna see several examples here over the next several slides. Um, uh, one of the probably most obvious and biggest uh, uh, strategies that can be implemented is uh, modification of existing structures, whether that be undersized culverts, um, uh, stream crossings, bridges, box culverts. Uh, oftentimes you'll see these structures uh, have a much smaller hydraulic opening than uh, the bank full width of the stream. And that can, can constrict and uh, cause localized flooding at these structures. Of course, any modification that's made to uh, roadways and, and stream crossings needs to be done in the cooperation with the uh, Rhode Island uh, Department of Transportation and all our, our local municipalities. Next slide. We can also talk about uh, mitigation strategies that include modifications to the stream channel. Uh, I performed a, a preliminary site reconnaissance back in April and noticed uh, uh, portions of the lower reach of the Unasquatucket uh, to be highly channelized. So narrowed stream channels, uh, uh, hard face uh, walls, all of which will increase the uh, flow velocity and erosion that's associated with it. Allowing the river to access the floodplain and, and widen the stream channel so as to reduce flow velocities all uh, ultimately result in uh, fewer flood events. Next slide. We'll also be looking at the possibility of uh, bridge deck modifications. As part of our uh, hydraulic analysis of, of the watershed, we'll be obtaining uh, low cord elevations on all, all the existing uh, bridges, bridge decks within the watershed. And it's possible that some of those existing bridges are positioned too low and, and do act as a constriction point uh, within the watershed and we'll be evaluating whether or not modification of existing bridges uh, may result in, a, in a, a lower flooding probability. Next slide. Based on the hydro, uh, hydraulics in the stream, uh, sometimes you see the formation of uh, sand or silt bars uh, where material is deposited, where velocities are, are a little bit lower. Uh, sometimes these obstructions can act uh, in a way that uh, causes localized flooding and potential removal could improve uh, downstream flooding characteristics. So uh, these mitigation strategies would only be considered uh, very carefully and in uh, consultation with 
uh, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, because we, we understand that there's also valuable uh, aquatic habitat that is normally associated with these, these sandbars or silt bars or woody obstructions. Next slide. And finally, um, regardless of whatever mitigation strategies we are considering, we, we will be looking at the valuable cultural resources that are associated, especially within this watershed. There are a lot of old, beautiful uh, residential and commercial buildings. And of course, the, the, the value on those structures uh, cannot really be measured. So um, it will be one of the, the many considerations that are made in, in our overall analysis. And with that, I believe I'm passing it back over to Ayana with next steps. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. That was great. And thank you, Jeff, as well. So yes, we do have some next steps. Uh, we're going to document and assess the findings of this meeting and the other meeting that we're having later this week. So we're going to gather all of your comments, whether you make them tonight or send, this, send them to us via email um, at the project email address or people, the ones that people make at the next meeting. We're going to gather all those. They will not be lost. Um, we will respond to you and let you know that we received your comment, even if we're not able to fully answer the question because we haven't reached that point in the evaluation of the study and different features yet. But um, we will let you know that it will be addressed as we develop the watershed plan hyphen environmental document. <clears throat> so to that end, um, we will be doing further field season events, uh, including you know, not only the, the landscape features that are obvious and we can see, but also um, any soil testing that's necessary to validate some of the alternatives as they're developed. Um, we also want to identify um, if there are any hazardous waste areas in these sections of the watershed uh, so that we can make sure to avoid them. Uh, we do not in this program take on responsibility for mitigating for uh, hazardous waste. Okay. We will also um, be developing alternatives of, as we have all discussed this evening. That is the goal of the watershed plan hyphen environmental document is that we actually develop feasible alternatives looking at all the different resource concerns and all the different factors uh, in the community for what can be done. And then we're going to coordinate uh, with various governing agencies. Uh, this project is like many other projects that are dealing with infrastructure that you have seen before. Uh, we will need permits. We will need permits from DEM. We will need permits from the Army Corps of Engineers. We will need permits from any regulatory agency that has an intersection with the types of practices and things that we're doing on this project. And um, the town and the city will take the lead on acquiring those permits. But of course, with technical assistance from uh, NRCS and DDK, absolutely. So we will present all our alternatives to you in the form of the draft worship plan hyphen environmental document. And so that is several months away. That's not something that's right around the corner. Um, but when we get there, we will be hosting another public meeting like this one, or it could be in person. It depends on where we are in terms of the health of the country. Um, with regards to the pandemic and, and hopefully nothing else comes up, but um, it does depend on where we are and we're going to uh, adhere to state law, of course, but then also we have USDA policy and rules and guidelines about gathering people um, and where we can have face to face meetings so we're going to play that by ear. Um, we have in the past, you know, in, in past years, we have had in person public meetings and if we can again, then we will, but if we cannot. Um, and we may just keep this option as well for people who prefer it to be able to um, participate remotely instead and make sure we catch as wide an audience as we possibly can for people who live, work, or just travel through the watershed and have an interest in this project. Okay, and then we will be finalizing the watershed plan once we get those comments and assess them and um, have them reflected in the watershed plan then we'll finalize it and it'll be sent back out again for public review and knowledge that that's what we're proceeding with. And at that point, then some internal documents will be developed. 
the watershed plan eventually will need to be approved by the chief of my agency in order for the project to move into the next phase, which is design. So once all of the public review for the project is done, that is when um, that happens, when we have a few more internal reviews by NRCS and uh, then is presented to the head of my agency, who we call the chief, the chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And um, that's a gentleman at this time, his name is Terry Cosby, and um, he will sign it and then it will be official and we will be eligible to request funding for the next phase in design. Okay, next slide, please. So here you are, this is the uh, project email address. Please feel free to send comments and questions to it. Once again, um, we're happy to take your information and we'll receive your comments and we'll let you know that we received your comments, but we may not be able to give you a full technical answer at this time because we may not have made a decision on a particular feature or aspect of the project. Um, we are still in the information gathering and engineering assessment phase of the project. So we haven't made any firm decisions about alternatives um, in terms of features that will be developed, any of the measures that Andy just talked about, um, where they're gonna go, how big they're gonna be, anything like that. None of those types of decisions have been made. So for this first round, we would like to receive your comments by July 10th. Uh, as I mentioned during the previous slide, you will have another opportunity to comment once the alternatives have actually been developed and there's a draft worship plan hyphen environmental document. Um, but just if you have anything that you think of right now, we would love to hear from you. We really would. And um, we'd just like to get that from you at least by July 10th. Uh, we do still prefer electronic communication if, if that's okay. But if, um, if that's a problem for anyone, if you are able to uh, just send us an email, let us know that. We can provide you with a mailing address if you prefer to mail it in. Um, we're not doing very many in the office meetings yet, but um, that may become an, an option later on in the project lifespan as well. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now is the part of the presentation where we try to turn it back over to you a little bit and see if you have any questions that you want to ask us or if you just have any comments or some input that you wanna to give to let us know about some things you wanna make sure that we consider. Um, we wanna know, we wanna hear from you. And as it says on the slide, yes, um, you can type your questions into the Q&A box or you can use your hand uh, to, if you have a question, the little raise hand function is down there on the, the bottom bar and uh, we will recognize you and we will listen to you because we wanna know what a successful project would look like for you. And so we would like to hear from you. Um, hopefully you feel comfortable making comments now, but if you don't, once again, you can email them in later or if you wanna to listen to this, this presentation again, you're welcome to attend the next meeting, which will be on Thursday of this week at this same time. So we've got a few questions. Uh, Franco started off uh, early in the, the presentation and asking whether DDK would be conducting any dam integrity studies. I'm assuming those were relative to the Smithfield dams. Okay, I can take that. Um, so, we will be researching some of the dams that are in the area if we think that they have a potential uh, intersection with the project, whether we're wondering or some of our preliminary studies show that they might not be retaining as much water as we would have expected, or if we um, think that we might be able to enhance the dam as a feature to provide more flood protection in the project. That doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to raise it to the level of a dam integrity study. We're gonna find out who operates it and who owns it. And we're gonna find out what information they have about the dam. And then we're going to assess as we go through this process, the likelihood of us needing to intersect with the dam, keep it, rehabilitate it, ask for it to be torn down, any one of those things. Um, so that'll be a process of, of evaluating it, but uh, it may not be considered a separate study and it may not be published as such. And Alex had asked uh, along those lines a question about whether there were any specific plans for the Georgiaville dam slash water control structure. Okay, so sure, um, I'll talk about that too. We have identified it as a, a potential location that might be useful to the project for flood protection, but no decision has been made about it yet. Um, so we're, we're aware of it and some of the protection that's providing now and 
And we're going to look into that as we go through this process. And yeah, Paul, I'm glad the picture was good enough you could recognize it, Alex. And Alex also <laughs> asked whether or not we expected any eminent domain activity. Eminent domain is always a possibility with any watershed project. It's one of the authorities that we require our sponsors to have. We, I mean NRCS, our federal agency, requires that. Um, but it's not something that we look to use first. We, we prefer to have discussion with the people who own the property and let them know of the risk associated with not participating versus participating. And um, we'll see how integral it is to the overall project. If you know there's a property and it only negatively impacts that one property and nothing else, then it's likely that eminent domain would not be used. Um, but if it's a property that impacts the a whole you know section of town and nothing else can move forward because NRCS does require the systems to work. So we wouldn't put in a one component of a system if it required three other components to work. It's, it's kind of an all or nothing situation. It's got to all work together. Uh, we don't want to, as I mentioned earlier, we're not trying to push the problem onto the next neighbor downstream. We're trying to resolve it and uh, handle the water in a more effective and safe manner. Okay, and then Frank asked another question. Um, given the Rhode Island DOT stormwater suit settlement with EPA, how will those stormwater failures be remediated? Okay, so given that EPA and DOT have been to court about that already or um, in litigation, so to speak, um, that issue will remain between them. NRCS will not take that on. Uh, we would expect that those issues would be resolved in the near future. We can, in a certain manner, incorporate some of the things that DOT may be interested in seeing in terms of um, increased stormwater capacity on some of their roads. But as I mentioned just briefly earlier, we cannot overlap federal funds. So most, in most, I'm told in most of the Rhode Island state roads, uh, the roads that are maintained by DOT, there's federal funding in there. So that will continue to be their responsibility. We may be able to um, help them by pointing out that we're doing upgrades, you know, upstream and downstream of that road. And we'd like to get that as a priority for them so that when we're also under construction with this project, they can repair that part as well so that the whole system functions together. But we're not going to take over responsibility for uh, DOT's roads. Okay, and then he asked, uh, what, what is the assumed storm? What is the assumed flood probability? 0.2% or 1%? So what we typically look at in terms of flood protection that we can provide, we're trying to get the most bang for our buck. Um, like anybody else, this is taxpayer funding and we're trying to provide the highest level of protection that we possibly can. So our minimum is a 100 year frequency storm for a watershed project. Um, but we have seen some flood protection measures go in and provide protection up to the 500 year event. Um, so it, it just depends on what we can do that's going to be economically feasible and environmentally defensible um, in this context. Okay, and Frank has his hand raised. So I'm gonna allow, hit allow to talk and he can ask his question directly. Frank, you should be able to talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Perfect. I'm asking those questions because it looks like there's a ton of opportunity in Smithfield to present, uh, that present opportunities to absorb water or at least slow the flow down, downstream to Providence. And one of the big concerns I have is that the only municipal wastewater treatment plant in the watershed is in Smithfield, but should that get um, overcome, it would affect everything downstream, including the bay. Um, and based on the history of previous flooding and other rivers, such as the ones in Pennsylvania and the ones in, uh, in Rhode Island earlier, uh, it's, it's a big issue. So making that as bulletproof as possible has the biggest bang for the buck in terms of um, pollution. 
Okay, thank you for that comment. And um, we agree that there are some good flood retention, flood water retention uh, possibilities in the town of Smithfield. Um, one of the things, or a couple of the things that we have to keep in mind is the wastewater treatment plant is responsible for a certain level of flood protection that they provide to themselves under their own funding. Uh, in this project, we would consider it critical infrastructure, and so we would analyze it and what, what goes on with regards to floodwaters that come their direction. Um, but we have to, once again, check and see how it's run and who operates and maintains it and how it's funded in terms of whether or not we will necessarily um, provide it any direct flood, flood prevention measures. Um, the other part of what you asked, I'm sorry, I just lost a little bit of it. Um, in terms of downstream in Providence, uh, oh, and in terms of slowing down the water, we do want to slow down the flood water to a certain level. Uh, I mentioned a little bit briefly earlier that we recognize that rivers and streams, though, need to have a certain amount of water in them to maintain the habitat, the aquatic habitat. So we will be looking at that as well. That's another feature that's important to NRCS and we're the Conservation Service, Natural Resources Conservation Service. So we're not looking to remove all of the water, even if that would necessarily be convenient for uh, human life and human interaction in the area. Okay, do you have a further comment, Frank? I muted you again, Frank, so I can- Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, uh, thank you, Ayanna. Uh, it, it, it is an involved process and it's, it's somewhat um, challenging to the average citizen because it seems not only, it, it seems to be a painful process that, that you have to go through, but we certainly <laughs> wish you well in this. Uh, one of the issues was that because of the Rhode Island uh, DOT settlement, None of the accumulated sediment from this highway runoff was removed. The state of Rhode Island did a land swap. They bought 80 acres adjacent to the Audubon Preserve in, a, in, in an adjacent town, basically, instead of fixing the problem. So we still have severe stormwater issues that are unremediated that only add to the problem. And, and that that to me requires some agency coordination. Ignoring that only makes your problem much more difficult to solve. Oh, sure. We wouldn't ignore um, what they have going on in that area since it's in the watershed. We would take a look at that. And if it's exacerbating the flooding, um, we would address it with them. I just want to make it clear that because we observe it in the process of this project doesn't mean that we have necessarily jurisdiction over DOT. Um, un un that so understood, un understood. Okay. I can send you photographs though of about an eighth of a mile long sandbar in Georgiaville Pond as a result of the sediment that's run off from the state's bad stormwater management uh, when we lowered the pond and we rebuilt the outlet structure. So uh, there's plenty of evidence that photo documentation I'll be happy to share with you at some point in time, should it be helpful. Okay, thank you. We would appreciate that. Uh, we'll just for your that. information also, we did core samples on the bottom of the pond okay. um, when the pond was lowered because of a previous upstream mill fire in the 80s. It was a hundred alarm fire and we wanted to make sure there was no toxins in the pond. Um, so the URI geotech department came up and did core samples in the pond bottom and at the beach area. And those, those samples are available as well. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's with URI? Yes. Okay, great. We'll take advantage of that information for sure. Super, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank let's you. see, we got a couple other questions. Um, are other watershed communities still able to sign on as sponsors, or is this restricted to Smithfield, PVD, or Providence at this point? And have those communities been previously consulted about the project? Okay, so I'll start at the uh, last question and then work my way back. Um, yes, other communities in the watershed have been have had the project as an opportunity discussed with them. Um, the potential to sign on as a sponsor to an existing project um, when you're talking about bringing in new land. 
that gets more and more complex the longer the project goes um, because we will have already completed some tasks in terms of doing field assessments and just general um, scientific inquiries about the land. So the longer we get into the process where we have these two, two sponsors identified um, and are focused on working in those areas, uh, the less likely it is that we would bring in another municipality. Instead, what that municipality could do, they're still welcome to participate in the watershed and flood prevention operations program. They would just be in a separate project. And it's fine that it's in the Wenasquatucket River watershed because we have identified in the process and on NRCS aside that we're only working where we have sponsorship. So we're only working and it's known by my agency um, at all levels, locally in Rhode Island and then also at our national headquarters that we're working in the town of Smithfield and the city of Providence. And although the overarching name of the project right now is the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Flood Protection Project, um, that could change if that doesn't adequately reflect or makes it somehow unclear to the public where we are in this other community or other communities want to have their own watershed protection um, project as well. So the program, it remains open to other communities that haven't signed up because NRCS recognizes that everybody is not in the same place. Everyone um, has to take time to decide the priorities for their municipality at a certain time. And as I mentioned before, we've had this program in one form or fashion in terms of level of funding um, for over 60 years. So it's an, I don't think it's going away. Um, it seems to be something that's getting used more and more now, uh, just like it was in the 60s at the last peak, I would say, I guess, of, of use of the program. So no one should feel like if they don't do it now, it'll never happen. Um, it's, it's still gonna be an option for them in the future. Okay, and finally, Kevin Cleary asked whether uh, he asks, is water quality a component of the project or just volume slash flow control? It's a good question. That's an interesting question. Um, we definitely will not do anything in the project to make the water quality worse. Um, it's not the goal of the project overall to improve hazardous water, but like Andy showed, we have some opportunities uh, or features and measures that we can use that will improve the water quality. Obviously, when we have stormwater runoff from roads intersecting with rivers and streams, uh, we'd like to get it as clean as possible before it gets back in that river or stream. So if we can put in some buffers and some other um, green infrastructure measures that will help to clean it up, we certainly will. We're going to take advantage of that. But we have to remember that there's a balance there because everything requires space. Space is land and land costs money in one form or fashion or another. So um, we're going to just, we'll be balancing it, but we will be looking at water quality from the aspect of we're not going to take in hazardous water into the project. Um, it's not our responsibility to clean that up, but if as much as we possibly can, and NRCS does this with individual landowners too, we like to keep the clean water clean. That's what we say. And so if we can do that, um, we will, and we'll look for those opportunities. We will actively look for opportunities to do that. Okay, and that is all of the questions that have been typed out. Okay, that's great. Thank you for those questions. We very much appreciate your attention and your participation here. Uh, if you think of anything else, we have a few more minutes. And if you don't want to ask now, you are welcome once again to use the um, project website. Chris, if you wouldn't mind bringing that slide back up, not website, I'm sorry, email address, the project email address and send us the questions later. Thank you. Yes, there it is. Wooney NRCS project at DuBoisKing.com. And we did just get another question. Uh, is there a limit to the NRCS funding that can be provided? Yes, there are limits in RCS's funding. Uh, we cannot spend more in combination in the first two phases than we can spend, than we will spend in the third phase. So currently with the flood protection project, NRCS pays for most of all the costs. 
but the more money we spend up front in the first two phases, the less money that we could potentially have for the third phase, which is actually installation or construction. But there are some things that NRCS cannot pay for. When we were talking earlier, when I was talking earlier on the roles and responsibilities slide, there was a slide about sponsor responsibilities. Irregardless of how much funding, like if Congress gave us you know, a billion dollars for this program, there are some things by law that NRCS can't pay for. So we cannot pay for the permitting and we can't pay for the land rights acquisition for the purpose of project implementation. If um, we need to do wetland mitigation in the project, NRCS can cost share that with the sponsors, even including land um, acquisition up to 50%. But for just the flood protection measures being installed in the project, <clears throat> NRCS, um, will pay up to 100% provided that we haven't spent um, more money in planning and design than we're going to need to spend in construction. And so there, there are some caveats to um, the funding that NRCS can provide. Okay, nobody raising their hand, no open questions. Okay, all righty. Well, we thank you very much for your participation this evening and uh, we look forward to seeing you at future meetings. And like I said um, earlier, we will be sending those out and advertising those in the newspaper again as well. So you'll be notified of those, but we have the other one later this week, just in case you think of something between now and then, please chime in. Um, and feel free to uh, leave the question in the question and answer section, even if you can't participate in the entire meeting. Something I should have mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry, but these presentations will be posted in English and Spanish on the NRCS Rhode Island State website. So um, they will be available there as well. And if you just Google NRCS, that will take you to our national website. And then up in the top right corner, it says there's a link to state websites and then just click on Rhode Island and that'll get you there. So that will be available as well. Okay. So seeing no new questions, I don't want to hold everybody. I know it's getting late into the evening and we really do appreciate your participation. So thank you so much for coming out, so to speak, by staying in and participating virtually. And uh, we look forward to having more meetings with you on this project in the future. Thank you and good night. Thank you.